I welcome you to the Way of the Cross. It's a devotion for Good Friday, devised especially for the parishes of Ickham, Littlebourne, Stodmarsh, Wickenbrew and Wingham, but of course available to any who choose to join us. It's set out as a kind of pilgrimage, as a journey, a journey that takes in in our imaginations, because of course we're all required to stay at home this year, that takes in all five of our churches and each one we make a station uh, where we focus on one of the episodes in the great story, the terrible story of the passion that is the suffering and death of our Lord Jesus Christ. It's a very ancient practice to, as it were, uh, make a journey on Good Friday with stations uh, for the, uh, each of the scenes of the Passion, the Way of the Cross. I commend it to you. We begin at Stodmarsh, where we focus and find ourselves in Gethsemane, the garden, where Jesus is betrayed and abandoned. It's the most northern of our five villages, our five churches, and we gather in this tiny and beautiful church, so small that its church, its graveyard, almost spills into the roadway. St Mark's Gospel, chapter 14, verses 41 to 50. Jesus came a third time and said to them, Are you still sleeping and taking your rest? Enough! The hour has come. The Son of Man is betrayed into the hands of sinners. Get up, let us be going. See, my betrayer is at hand. Immediately, while he was still speaking, Judas, one of the twelve, arrived. With him there was a crowd with swords and clubs, the chief priests, the scribes and elders. Now the betrayer had given them a sign, saying, The one I will kiss is the man. Arrest him and lead him away under guard. So when he came, he went up to him at once and said, Rabbi, and kissed him. Then they laid hands on him and arrested him. But one of those who stood nearby drew his sword and struck the slave of the high priest, cutting off his ear. Then Jesus said to them, Have you come out with swords and clubs to arrest me as though I were a bandit? Day after day I was with you in the temple teaching. You did not arrest me, but let the scriptures be fulfilled. All of them deserted him and fled. This is a bitter narrative of triple abject human failure. Firstly, Jesus' closest disciples, his best friends, could not in his hour of desperate need even manage to stay awake and support him by their prayers. Secondly, Judas heaps even greater shame on his act of betrayal by identifying Jesus with the most intimate mark of love, a kiss. Thirdly, all the disciples, who a few hours ago had protested their undying commitment to Jesus, run away when the real cost of being his follower is made clear. We recognise all these levels of failure in ourselves in our society and in our church. We're all good at making, whether publicly or only in the silence of our hearts, boastful claims about our integrity and courage that melt away into nothing when the true price becomes apparent. We all fool ourselves, if not those closest to us, with noble declarations that mask indifference or worse. We betray that which is, or should be, dearest to us. Our only comfort and recourse is that God in Christ Jesus knows all this, has suffered the effect of such human failure, and yet still loves us, forgives us, and saves us. Let us pray. Almighty God, whose most dear Son went not up to joy, but first he suffered pain, and entered not into glory before he was crucified, mercifully grant that we, walking the way of the cross, may find it none other than the way of life and peace, through Jesus Christ, your Son, our Lord. Amen.
we sing the hymn, There is a green hill far away. Now, in our imagination, we leave Stodmarsh, we journey by road or footpath across the fields to Littlebourne, we gather in the graveyard, the churchyard of St Vincent's, flanked by the great barn. Here we make our second station. It's the high priest's house where Peter denies Jesus. Mark 14, 53 to 54 and 66 to 72. They took Jesus to the high priest. All the chief priests, the elders, the scribes were assembled. Peter had followed at a distance right into the courtyard of the high priest. He was sitting with the guards, warming himself at the fire. While Peter was below in the courtyard, one of the servant girls of the high priest came by. When she saw Peter warming himself, she stared at him and said, You also were with Jesus, the man from Nazareth. They denied it, saying, I do not know or understand what you are talking about. He went out into the forecourt. Then the cock crowed. The servant girl, on seeing him, began again to say to the bystanders, This man is one of them. But again he denied it. Then, after a little while, the bystanders again said to Peter, Certainly you are one of them. You are a Galilean. But he began to curse. He swore an oath. I do not know this man you are talking about. At that moment, the cock crowed for the second time. Then Peter remembered that Jesus had said to him, Before the cock crows twice, you will deny me three times. And he broke down and wept. Peter is the disciple who blurts out and acts out what the other disciples are thinking or imagining, but lack the courage to say or to do. And of course, the disciples are us today. Nothing has really changed in human nature in two millennia. I sometimes think that Peter is, as it were, our subconscious taking on material form. He runs away with the others in Gethsemane, but finds just enough courage to follow on at a distance to see what will happen next. Then he is given three chances to make good his earlier failure, three chances to proclaim that he is indeed a follower of Jesus. He fails each time, becoming more and more heated in his denial. I do not know the man you are talking about. I don't suppose any of us has actually ever pretended not to be a Christian, but our denial takes on subtler forms. For us, it's far more likely to be an acceptance of the prevailing morality of our social circle, of our workplace, our general culture, hiding the uncomfortable fact that we say our prayers and place God at the centre of our lives. Or in politics or economics, we fall in with what's expedient, reinforce our prestige, power and wealth, rather than apply the radical teaching of Jesus. Peter goes out, appalled by the realisation of the depths of his dereliction. But after the resurrection, Jesus will give him forgiveness and redemption. May he so grant us. Let us pray. Almighty and everlasting God, when your tender love toward the human race sent your Son, our Saviour, Jesus Christ, to take upon him our flesh, to suffer death upon the cross, grant that we may follow the example of his patience and humility, and also be made partakers of his resurrection, through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. We sing the hymn, Drop, Drop, Slow Tears. Now, in our imaginations, we leave Littlebourne. We journey by road or footpath across the fields to Wickenbrew, gathering on the green with the church's glorious east window above us. Here, at this third station, we are in Pilate's headquarters. Here, we recognise or witness true kingship. John's Gospel, chapter 18, 
verses 28 to 38. Then they took Jesus from Caiaphas to Pilate's headquarters. It was early in the morning. They themselves did not enter the headquarters so as to avoid ritual defilement and to be able to eat the Passover. So Pilate went out to them and said, What accusation do you bring against this man? They answered, If this man were not a criminal, we would not have handed him over to you. Pilate said to them, Take him yourselves and judge him according to your law. The Jews replied, We are not permitted to put anyone to death. This was to fulfil what Jesus had said when he indicated the kind of death he was to die. Then Pilate entered the headquarters again, summoned Jesus and asked him, Are you the king of the Jews? Jesus answered, Do you ask this on your own or did others tell you about me? Jesus replied, I am not a Jew, am I? Your own nation and the chief priests have handed you over to me. What have you done? Jesus answered, My kingdom is not from this world. If my kingdom were from this world, my followers would be fighting to keep me from being handed over to the Jews. But as it is, my kingdom is not from here. Jesus asked him, So you are a king? Jesus answered, You say that I am a king. For this I was born, and for this I came into the world, to testify to the truth. Everyone who belongs to the truth listens to my voice. Pilate asked him, What is truth? Notice the paradox. To avoid ritual defilement, the priests are careful not to enter Pilate's palace. He has to come out to speak to them. Yet what they are desperate to bring about is the greatest defilement in history. Their religious observance binds them to what they are actually doing. Their scrupulous following of the law leads them to destroying, into destroying the very culmination of that law, the fulfilment of all its prophecy. And if religion fails so abjectly, then philosophy is just as bad. What is truth? asks Pilate, preferring to turn from the life and death reality before him to something abstract, distancing himself from the unfolding tragedy, setting aside the power he wields to open up an intellectual discussion. It's called displacement activity, finding anything to do or say that removes us from the painful realities that confront us, retreating into rules or abstractions. The life of Jesus impels us in exactly the opposite direction, returns us again and again to what's actually happening, to the real persons before us and around us, to the actual situation, and challenges us to engage fully with them and with it, even at the cost of overturning our most cherished patterns of belief and behaviour. Let us pray. Almighty Father, look with mercy on this your family, for which our Lord Jesus Christ was content to be betrayed and given up into the hands of sinners and to suffer death on the cross, who is alive and glorified with you and the Holy Spirit, one God, now and for ever. Amen. A hymn, Rock of Ages, cleft for me, let me hide myself and thee. We sing together. Now in our imaginations we leave Wickenbrew and journey by road or footpath the short distance to Ickham. We gather on the wonderful green, the lovely green before the church, flanked by those avenues of trees. Here we make our next station. We are at Gabatha, where the people demand Jesus' death. Mark 15, 6 to 15. Now at the festival, Pilate used to release a prisoner for them, anyone whom they asked. Now a man called Barabbas was in prison with the rebels which committed murder during the inter insurrection. So the crowd came and began to ask Pilate to do for them according to his custom. He answered them, Do you want me to release to you the king of the Jews? 
he realised it was out of jealousy the chief priests had handed him over, that the chief priests stirred up the crowd to have him release Barabbas for them instead. Pilate spoke to them again. Then what do you want me to do with the man you call King of the Jews? They shouted back, Crucify him! Pilate asked them, Why? What evil has he done? They shouted all the more, Crucify him! So Pilate, wishing to satisfy the crowd, released Barabbas for them, and after flogging Jesus, he handed him over to be crucified. We know who this crowd is. They're the same people who a few short days earlier went wild with excitement as they welcomed Jesus into the city of David. But he's totally let them down, betrayed their hopes, what they thought he promised them. Instead of raising an army and driving out the, the hated Romans, instead of restoring the throne of David to its political power, instead of raising the worship of the temple and the righteous keeping of the law to new heights of purity, his teaching undercut their certainties, challenged everything they put their trust in. His kingdom, he tells Pilate, is not of this world. But that's exactly where they want his kingdom to be located. Because he so badly dashed their hopes, there's only one solution. However brutally, he must be got rid of. We recognise all these traits in ourselves, these all too human patterns of behaviour, and especially the determination to remove from our lives anything and anyone that challenges our dearest aspirations, in particular, the high esteem in which, however secretly, we like to hold ourselves. Jesus' teaching and example seem to tell us the opposite. Pay deep attention to everything and everyone that irritates us and unsettles our self-esteem. It's the only way we can let God into our lives to transform and change us, to bring us from death to life. We know who this crowd is. It's us. Let us pray. Almighty Father, look with mercy on this your family, for which our Lord Jesus Christ was content to be betrayed and given up into the hands of sinners and to suffer death upon the cross who is alive and glorified with you in the Holy Spirit, one God, now and for ever. Amen. By him, when I survey the wondrous cross on which the Prince of Glory died, in our imagination we leave Ickham, we journey on by road or footpath, we're drawn by the marvellous tower and spire of Wingham, as it rises above the fields, we gather beneath the protecting walls of that fine church. Our fifth station, Golgotha, the crucifixion. Mark 15, 22 to 37. Then they brought Jesus to the place called Golgotha, which means place of a skull. They offered him wine mixed with myrrh, he did not take it. They crucified him and divided his clothes among them, casting lots to decide what each should take. It was nine o'clock in the morning when they crucified him. The inscription on the charge read him, read the King of the Jews, and with him they crucified two bandits, one on his right, one on his left. Those who passed by derided him, shaking their heads and saying, Aha! You who would destroy the temple and build it in three days, save yourself, come down from the cross. In the same way the chief priests, among, along with the scribes, also mocked him among themselves and saying, He saved others, he cannot save himself. Let the Messiah, the King of Israel, come down from the cross now, so that we may see and believe. Those who were crucified with him also taunted him. When it was noon, darkness came over the whole land until three in the afternoon. At three o'clock, Jesus cried out with a loud voice, Eloi, 
Eloi Lamach Samachtani, which means, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? When some of the bystanders heard it, they said, listen, he's calling for Elijah. Someone ran, filled a sponge with sour wine, put it on a stick and gave it to him to drink, saying, wait, let's see whether Elijah will come to take him down. Then Jesus gave a loud cry and breathed his last. Mark's Gospel gives us the starkest and shortest account of the crucifixion. Nothing takes away from its brutality or sense of dereliction. This is what human beings can do to each other, always have done, and in our own day still do, in appalling numbers. Jesus dies in agony on the cross, a king indeed raised on his throne. Despite the bitter taunts he receives, even in his last hour he rules over a suffering world, not in judgment or condemnation, but alongside, from within, taking on the worst we can do and have done to us. This is redemption from inside, not from a comfortable distance, not from a secure platform above all the problems. So God is with our world today as it reels from coronavirus, in every war zone, in every refugee camp, in every detention centre, in every self-isolating home, in every food bank, in every high dependency unit, hooked up to every ventilator. Christ shows us that kinship lies at the heart of true kingship, the servant who suffers so that we might be liberated from the very sins which bring him to the cross. This is how we meet, find, know, love, and are given the inspiration and strength so to love in our turn. Let us pray, Heavenly Father, as we stand at the foot of the cross of your Son, help us to see and know your love for us, so that in humility, love and joy, we may place at his feet all that we have and all that we are, through Jesus Christ, our Saviour. Amen. As, taught, as Jesus taught us, so we pray together, our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name, thy kingdom come, thy will be done in earth as it is in heaven. Give us today our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power and the glory, for ever and ever. Amen. Our final hymn, O Sacred Head, So Wounded. Our final prayer. O Lord Jesus Christ, Son of the living God, set your passion, cross and death between your judgment and our souls, now and in the hour of our death. Grant mercy and grace to the living, rest to the departed, to your church, peace and concord, and to us sinners, forgiveness and everlasting life and glory. For with the Father and the Holy Spirit, you are alive and reign, God, now and forever.